All righty. Uh, hello and welcome. My name is Ray Thompson. I'm the Senior Director here at Avid for Partner in Industry Marketing, and I want to welcome you all to Episode 6, the Avid Studio Webinar Series, where today we're going to focus on security in the cloud. So uh, real quick, here's the agenda. We're going to uh, cover uh, the webinar goals. Uh, I'll cover some logistics in terms of answering uh, questions or asking questions you may have throughout the webinar. Uh, then we're going to do a quick overview of kind of uh, some of the challenges. And we'll also talk about the Movie Lab's uh, overall vision, uh, including the more recent paper around security. Um, and then we'll have a roundtable discussion about security in the cloud as a topic. Um, and then uh, we'll take some questions from the group and we'll finish it off with some, uh, some closing thoughts. So at the end of this uh, webinar, you should have a pretty good understanding of not just the key security challenges that exist today, but you should have a good understanding of the overarching Movie Lab's vision for, for cloud security and some of the things that have to happen between now and then in order to achieve uh, some of what's laid out in the paper. And then uh, we'll also talk uh, through some of Microsoft's strategy as well as we're, as we're kind of talking through the overall discussion. And then at the end, uh, like I said, we'll, we'll take some questions and, uh, and we'll, like I said, uh, hit on the vision for how we close some of the existing security gaps that is, exist today. So logistics, if you have a question, please use the Q&A button in, in, uh, in your Zoom chat, if you're in the Zoom room. If you are taking part uh, via a social media channel or platform today, thank you. Um, go ahead and ask questions on those channels as well, as we do have people monitoring those channels. And uh, what we'll do is at the end, we'll answer any questions that come in. We also have some folks who will be monitoring uh, the Q&A and we'll also, uh, uh, answer those questions there. If we don't get to all of them uh, at the end, we'll we'll certainly answer them all, and we will send that out with the recording, uh, so that you have any answers that you may may need. And uh, we'll we'll get to the next piece here. So once again, my name is Ray Thompson, and I am the senior director of partner marketing here at Avid. And we have a distinguished panel today uh, to talk about security in the cloud. And first and foremost, I want to thank the panel for being a part of this today. And I'm gonna start with Joel. Joel, welcome to the webinar. You wanna introduce yourself? Yes, uh, thanks, Ray. Uh, my name is Joel Sloss. I'm a senior program manager for security and compliance in media and entertainment. Um, and, uh, I work a lot with industry partners such as Avid, uh, as well as different studios and production companies on helping them deploy um, secure pipelines for uh, film and, uh, and TV. Excellent, thanks, Joel. We have Spencer Stevens. Spencer, you want to introduce yourself, please? All right, I can get my camera to work. Um, yeah, hi, I'm Spencer Stevens. I'm the uh, SVP of Production Technology and Security at Movie Labs. Uh, Movie Labs is a joint venture of the five major Hollywood studios, and we focus on uh, technology innovation. Excellent. Thank you so much, Spencer, for being here today. And last but certainly not least, Omer Farouk. Omer, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hey guys, my name is Amir Farouk. Um, I'm actually uh, part of the Austin Security. We focus on and on content security for large, uh, all, all kinds of workflows in the cloud uh, regarding the content creation and deployment of uh, workflows to actually deliver content to consumers and do it securely. So day to day, I'm focused on how to build uh, how to build pipelines of content delivery mechanisms and, and packaging usually. Excellent. Thanks. And thank you all again for being here today. So let's, let's see this thing up. So, um, you know, if you think about some of the challenges and you go back uh, in sort of recent history here, often the challenge around security was really solved by securing the perimeter, if you will. Right. And so for a number of years, as long as you had the perimeter secured, um, you were in pretty good shape um, and you were able to guard against all the different threats that are out there today. More recently, that started to get a little more challenging because you know traditional television started to branch out into OTT, and as OTT became more and more important, delivering content over commodity internet uh, from a studio as part of a regular broadcast uh, became a very important component to how the news organizations, sports organizations, really a lot of media organizations, uh, ultimately were building a new audience and really dealing directly with the consumer. So that presented a whole new set of challenges. The ripple effect of some of those challenges also uh, meant that 
news gathering, for example, started changing. And that meant that folks were now using a lot more as it relates to IP and protocols to basically do contribution into their news organization. What this was really affording the organizations who were adopting these methodologies was being able to cover more with less, basically studio uh, 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 trucks, basically, if you will, uh, that were all sort of now just in a backpack. Um, and they were able to stream either over standard uh, internet or basically using some type of mobile signal to then send live contribution back into the studio. But in order to enable that, again, that uh, really needed the studios to then lower their guard a little bit and open up some ports in order to take in those streams. So traditionally you had satellite fiber and then that was handed off SDI, which was traditionally very secure, but then you had a lot of IP methodologies, which you know, afforded a, an amazing amount of, of uh, certainly convenience and broader coverage, but at the same time presented some, some new technology challenges. Of course, in the last year, um, a year and a half, I should say, uh, the pandemics forced the work from home mantra to become reality on a, every single day. Um, and it lasted way longer uh, than anybody ever thought. Uh, what this did was present even more security challenges. And many people uh, started to sort of really accelerate their move to the cloud while at the same time um, trying to access content uh, on-prem through, again, secure uh, methodologies. A lot of them were things like PCOIP, for example, tool sets to allow you to basically work with systems that were on-prem. A lot of uh, media companies turned directly to the cloud and basically spun up cloud environments um, in lieu of uh, accessing content uh, via systems that are on-prem. Again, all of which really changed the paradigm from a security perspective and really accelerated not only the move to both the cloud and the adoption of a lot of these other methodologies for gathering and ultimately distributing content, but it also uh, raised up, again, a lot of uh, interesting security challenges. And that's true, not just in broadcast news and sports, um, but it's also true in uh, things like in things like posts. So in traditional posts, you have a lot of similar challenges. So uh, what was going on for the longest time, again, traditional brick and mortar facilities were used to getting content that was shot, say, on set, and we were receiving that content either via some type of LTO tape uh, or maybe some type of hard drive that was then coming into the building. And it was a very linear process to do things like transcripts and logging content and certainly any pre-prep or string out creation uh, before the craft editor actually started doing his work, right, or her work. So... Again, that started to also change pre-pandemic quite a bit in the sense that you had more and more happening on set. There was a lot more uh, going on uh, in terms of how content was being not only created and shot, but how it was actually being done on set in terms of being able to do things like that transcoding and or uh, some of that logging and certainly some of those transcripts. And people were trying to do more in parallel and try and do it uh, on set. Then you started to see the migration of uh, some of those IP methodologies. People are now starting to try and stream content into the cloud, which is a, new, a more recent phenomenon. Again, introducing and changing the paradigm from securing the perimeter to now having to worry about uh, a lot of other sort of factors that are uh, you know, things to consider when setting up your security. And so <clears throat> we've seen a lot of that. And also we've seen, even on set, we've seen uh, some recent things, for example, like ILM, where they're building out these facilities that allow you to basically do a lot of work shot inside of a controlled environment with multi-camera setups um, and, a, and an entire sort of virtualized environment. Uh, again, all connected in some way, shape or form um, to, to the internet. Again, providing uh, net new challenges for even on set. So the paradigm uh, shift is very real. And of course, then the pan pandemic hits. And again, it forces everybody to start to work at home. And again, you sort of had uh, really two, two sort of methodologies and two camps. And certainly we saw this at Avid. It was, um, I need to be able to enable my staff to get access to on-prem uh, resources to then continue and have business continuity. And then we also had folks who turned completely to the cloud and relied on something like it on demand which is basically editorial in the cloud. And again, the challenges became uh, very different uh, for folks and securing the perimeter certainly wasn't uh, gonna work anymore. So you have all of these new factors, you have all these different workflows, tons of benefits, of course, uh, to all of the different methodologies as everything starts to really evolve and evolve very quickly uh, in multiple different directions. Um, and so while there's so many great things that are, are coming out of certainly these new workflows, um, there's certainly a lot of challenges. 
So not long ago, um, Movie Labs uh, and Spencer Stevens and his group basically put out both a sort of vision for the future as well as a subsequent follow-up to that, which delved into the security aspects of basically moving production into the cloud. And so uh, one of the things that we're gonna talk about today is really digging in on that. And if you look at this latest slide and you start to see sort of the longer term vision where everything ultimately ends up in the cloud, you have all these different factors that I'm kind of talking about. You have onset work happening. It's now connected to uh, the cloud in some way, shape or form for either uploading content, either both sort of uh, as proxies or uh, the full res as a file transfer right behind it. You have uh, folks who are now remote editing uh, that content and trying to do it uh, more quickly in, in sort of uh, a parallel fashion as opposed to a linear fashion, the way it used to be done, as I mentioned before. You have all these other different resources that may still be in traditional brick and mortar facilities, but we're all now connected in new ways uh, into the cloud, again, reliant more on uh, resources that are sitting inside of uh, an Azure uh, cloud service. And then once it's in Azure itself, uh, you have all these other services that you're now kicking off, different jobs, artificial intelligence, machine learning. Maybe you're doing some type of transcoding and sending that content out of say a Nexus system uh, to yet another system to do that sort of content processing work and then having it checked back in. Those are all net new uh, things to think about when it comes to security. And then of course there's distribution and distribution is certainly changing uh, all the time, whether it be things like cloud-based playout or certainly OTT distribution um, and all the way out to the consumer, where again, in the past, it was really a linear broadcast for sort of traditional news and sports. Now they uh, also now deliver over the top to consumers through either social media or through apps. So there's a whole host of different uh, sort of challenges there uh, that we're gonna really touch on today. And so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Spencer. And, and Spencer, if you wanna just touch a little bit more on sort of uh, both the, the evolution of, of media creation paper that came out not long ago, and then the subsequent piece to that, which is the security part, which is what we're gonna focus on today. Yeah, um, well, I might find out. God, I wish I showed up. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the thing was in, uh, I think it was actually at IBC in 2019, we published uh, this vision, a uh, 10 year vision of the future of media production. And there's a couple of pieces to it. Um, one is that we think that by then uh, the cloud will become a shared resource across an entire production. So rather than uh, each part of the production having their own cloud, which is typically what we see today with the editorial department or um, a post-production facility, we think that the, the, the cloud is going to become a shared resource across everyone. And more importantly, perhaps, is we envision that the, uh, all the data going directly into the cloud and then the application moving to the data rather than today, uh, or what you see is the data moving to the application. Um, and part of when we're working on this, we really came to the conclusion that this really needed a whole new uh, approach to security. Um, and we, so we followed up the, that white paper at the end of 2019 with a white paper on the evolution of um, production security, which is looking at the reasons why it should be the right security model. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, please. Raymond? Yep, can you see it? Uh, uh -oh. I can't. You guys still see it? Um, I don't know about anybody else, but I'm still stuck on the evolution of production. Oops, Spencer's. Uh... It's updating. Joel, do you, uh, there you go. Joel, do you see it? Yeah, I was uh, unceremoniously dumped out of the chat. Oh. <laughs> Like I thought maybe you didn't like it anymore. <laughs> Sorry about that. Spencer, are you uh, are you there still? Okay. Um back again. All right. I'm not sure what happened there. Uh but can you see uh the security perimeter slide? I could not, but let me yeah. talk through it anyway. Actually, could I check? Does anybody else see it? Because yeah, I'm seeing okay. it. 
We can right. just edit all of this out in post. Okay. Um, so the thing about this is, is that when you look at uh, the way um, we do security in production at the moment, it's being done in a facility, and that facility is uh, within, has got a security perimeter around it. Um, so everything that's part of a workflow, participant, the people, person doing it, what they're doing, the device they're doing it on, the application they're using, and the assets that they are doing it to is all within the security perimeter and the, the infrastructure itself there is trusted. Um, all very well and good, but this doesn't really work very well uh, when you go to the cloud. And in fact, even today, it really only works as, as well as your security perimeter. And we've seen lo lots of issues with that over the, particularly over the last couple of years. Let's go to the next slide though, and let's look at um, how we believe that uh, the, um, the, the next step of the architecture will be. Um, did you advance it, Raymond, or? I did, I did. And I'm not sure what's going on. Joel, oh, there we go. Okay, you... sorry about that. It's all yeah. like a broadband out here, probably. Um, okay, so what we've done here is we've assumed that you cannot trust the infrastructure, and I'm not insulting uh, Microsoft here, but the point is that uh, uh, down at the bottom level, the infrastructure is probably obviously secure. But when you've got all these different uh, uh, parts, moving parts, people working on the production, all these different applications running, you, you, you're foolhardy to, to trust the infrastructure, even if it can be trusted. So we broke this down. We took it down to uh, the participant needs to be authenticated. Um, the task they're doing needs to be authorized. They have a certain time period in which they're going to be doing it. Um, the device has to be trusted. The application has to be approved and they're doing it to a protected asset. So what we've done here is we've really uh, taken the principle of zero trust network and applied this to a workflow. And so each part of that is protected and therefore the whole thing is protected. And the other thing about this is, is we're not just about protecting the assets, which is the, the primary goal at the moment of production security, but here we're also uh, protecting the integrity of the workflow. Um, let's go to the next one and let's hope it comes up on my slide, but I do not well enough to talk through it. Um, so the next uh, image here um, is the, the architecture of the uh, uh, of common security architecture for production. And we've broken this down into um, several parts. So the core security components in the center is where um, the the work has been done. That's the piece of the architecture which is very much domain specific. In other words, the pieces in there need to know they're working on a workflow. And in fact, we've tried to make that part of the architecture as small as possible. Um, on the left side, and this is the very important thing here, is this whole uh, security architecture is driven by the workflow management. That's a software defined workflow in the scheduling system because that's what is, is the part of the system that knows what needs to be authorized and when. And within the core security components, we've broken down authentication from authorization and everything has to be authenticated before it can take part in any workflow, okay. but it has to be authorized to take part in a specific workflow. And it's that authorization, which is triggered by whatever is managing the workflow. On the right side of this diagram, we have the supporting security components, which are st standard services that the cloud providers provide. Um, and we did this deliberately because we're trying to put all the effort of implementing this onto standard services that already exist. So we're reducing the, uh, 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 there's no boxes here that say uh, magic happens here, but also we're trying to reduce the burden of switching to this model. Um, in the end, what we have here is our, our concept of policies coming out of it. These are dynamic security policies. And as I mentioned earlier, they only exist for uh, the period of time that a task is scheduled. And these go out to the policy enforcement points, which is a, a standard way of viewing uh, a, a zero trust network. Um, assets can be protected uh, ideally through uh, the encryption of individual assets. And they can be encrypted from the point of view, uh, from the point of creation through to the point of consumption. And that has a lot of advantages over the current uh, system, which is where you're constantly uh, encrypting and decrypting the asset every time you move it. 
and you're also storing it in a in a container that, that everybody needs access to. Um, so last slide, um, we've got some URLs here for you to, to follow. Uh, I'd encourage you to go and look at the Movie Labs website and uh, obviously particularly the bit on security, but what you'll find there is not just the, um, the white paper on security, but more importantly now, the uh, actionable architecture, uh, the first three parts of the architecture. We'll be following that up with um, three more uh, parts of it um, later this year. That's excellent. Thank you, Spencer. So I'm just gonna stop sharing for a second so we can have a chat. So, um, so Joel, I'm gonna start with you if you don't mind. So given sort of the, the vision presented in the Movie Lab security paper, where do you think we are today versus where you think uh, we, we need to go and, and what are some of the gaps uh, that exist in, in terms of achieving the vision for cloud security? Yeah, sure. Um, I guess, you know, just starting with, um, with what Spencer said about, you know, trusting in the platform, I, I think you are wise to not trust anything. Uh, and of course, that's the, that's the basis for zero trust is that, Everything has to be verified. Everything has to be authenticated. So, um, you know, when it comes down to it, the cloud as a platform um, needs to be treated as any other, you know, internal or, or external resource, um, you know, that you're protecting yourself from the resource, not just from the people using it. Um, as far as where we're at today, I think, you know, a great deal of um, you know, of what's in the security vision can actually be done today. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when it comes to fundamental uh, content protection, whether it's encryption or access control or, or role-based access, um, you know, DRM, the, the technologies that are needed for protecting the assets themselves, um, as well as the infrastructure that they sit on, um, you know, defending against threats, um, you know, firewalls and intrusion mm -hmm. prevention, uh, network ACLs on, on storage volumes, you know, all mm -hmm. of these things combined together, um, you know, with, with the layered security services like, um, you know, advanced threat protection. So, you know, they're, they're, all the pieces are in place and it really comes down to, you know, is the architecture of the solution in place? Um, you know, to be able to implement the rest of, uh, of that vision. Um, and I think that's, you know, in large part, that's where the challenges are going to come in the next few years is, you know, as people, you know, shift from an entirely on-prem to a hybrid model, which was obviously accelerated uh, by the pandemic, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and then into cloud native, um, it, it comes down to, you know, the either presence or lack thereof of awareness and education in your organization, um, you know, as well as designing, you know, for these new security principles. Um, that was a long winded way to answer that question. I, I, and I don't know if I even answered it. <laughs> no, no, I, yeah, I, no. I, I think that's good. Go ahead, Omar. No, I was just going to add to that. Like, I think you answered that question very well. But I also wanted to say, like, one of the future pieces that I see, um, I, th I do think the technical pieces or the technical components that, um, needed to build something like this already out there in Azure Cloud and other cloud vendors. But um, one of the things that I think we could, um, we are missing and we are building upon is how to actually work on the data together, um, which means like how do vendors who are implementing technology securely can work with other vendors together or work with content producers and content uh, delivery, uh, you know, large studios to work together to actually work on the data together. Um, and for those components specifically, we have the technology also to share um, drives or storage, storage mechanisms or, storage, or share computes. But that is one of the key fair drivers that I think we are not working or we will be working on the future that I think I see as a roadmap uh, for the next few years. Yeah, that's a good point. Spencer, when, when your group was authoring the paper, um, were you guys thinking of all the existing technologies or were you looking at things that maybe aren't uh, quite there yet uh, for the longer term vision? Like wh where were you guys uh, at when you, when you first authored uh, sort of the, the zero trust uh, vision? I, I think it's really started from a couple of things. I think, first of all, it became, was immediately apparent to us 
that the, the, the security perimeter just wasn't going to work. And I think, you know, I, I, I'm starting to doubt we're not security perimeters really well in general anymore. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, Zero Trust has been around for a while. Google um, has been really successful in deploying it on their enterprise. Um, so, and from that, we built the security architecture based on the fact that it needed to be zero trust. It needed to be workflow driven and the, it needs to be dynamic. And it's, it's the, the whole purpose here that one of the, the first principles of it was that the security should not uh, uh, interfere with the creative process. And at the moment it kind of does. And the difference is that we've gone for a security model, which is intrinsic security, security by design, as opposed to what we see today, which is extrinsic uh, security. It's imposed from outside. Um, and it's, the point was that I'm terribly pragmatic. I'm, I'm you know, a, an engineer. I like getting down with a, a keyboard or a soldering iron. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't going to design something that I wasn't fairly confident that can be done with, with existing technology. And even when I talk about asset encryption, as Joel alluded to a moment ago, it's really based on the way that DRMs work. Uh, and yep. you know, you, you can't say that DRMs don't scale because if you don't think DRMs scale, then you probably haven't been watching Netflix. Um, you know, so really we try very hard. The, the only piece that we've discovered that does need to be created uh, actually, it's a policy description language. This is a way of, uh, of, of these, these policies that get created, the dynamic policies, uh, of being able to send them around the system to, to disparate points of, of the system where the security um, uh, uh, act is, is um, imposed. Uh, uh, that's the one thing that we know needs to be created. And obviously, the APIs and stuff are going to be hard work, but we've done APIs before. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Yeah, Spencer is walking around with a soldering iron. Uh, remind me not to let him into any of our data centers. <laughs> I've still got my chip pulled. <laughs> so, Omer, when you, when you, uh, so we've sort of established that a lot of the technologies that are out there uh, exist today, of course, to implement a lot of what's laid out in sort of the vision. Um, you know, you do this all the time in terms of assessing uh, cloud security. What are what are some of the things that uh, you know you see uh, that are you know uh, either a uh, challenges um, and and some of the recommendations that you would make right in terms of sort of what uh, you know Spencer just mentioned security by design and making sure that as you're designing and building out a a cloud production environment that you're sort of building that as part of the sort of core for, for that architecture. Right. I mean, I think day to day what we see. Day to day, you're still seeing that people are not designing uh, security in the product intrinsically like it should be. Uh, people do uh, people do have very smart people working on um, at companies that can build security at the end, but usually that leaves a lot of gaps. Um, we um, essentially in day to day, I'm looking at and seeing that the, the way the storage and the compute on the networks are set up, they they can scale up, but they don't scale up uh, securely like they should. Um, and I think one of the bigger bigger holes that we see all the time is a lot of uh, attention is paid according to uh, somewhat of authentication authentication because we see a lot of attacks around authentication or weak weak mm -hmm. password storage and and those set of attack vectors. But people are not paying a lot of attention to RBAC controls and specifically building ABAC controls in the applications and 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 not leveraging cloud technologies and not leveraging the uh, in, uh, cloud native technologies that can make their life easier. We are still seeing a lot of um, a lot of tech that's that could be updated and could be optimized, uh, not just for performance, for security, if they were leveraging like Azure cloud native technologies. And I know, I know, um, Joel would love to talk more about Azure and stuff like that. But, um, but I think it's, it, but what I've seen is that, if, um, particularly in my vision, if you are going to go cloud native, not only uh, it helps you with, you know, a smaller footprint of code and small footprint of in terms of effort into building it, but also there was a lot more tools that you can integrate in the cloud um, that are available natively. Like you can plug and play within the, within the fabric of um, the cloud to enable. Um, for example, you can enable VAS directly. You can enable all kinds of security provisions that allow you to do zero trust. And we are not seeing those, but we, we are encouraging those. And hopefully in future, we will see more of those cloud native technologies being in integrated into workflows. I, I think one of the great things about, about what the cloud providers can, 
can give, and, and we you know, talked to Microsoft a lot about this, is this notion of dynamic risk management. You know, traditionally, risk management was an exercise you did, you know, twice a year or, or once a year, and somebody forced you to do it more frequently. But the fact is, it needs to be a real time uh, a part of the security system, and that's very important with zero trust. And you know, my general belief is that zero trust actually is, is based upon analyzing what's what's normal and, and letting that happen rather than trying to look for things that are abnormal because those signatures are usually out of date or or just you know impossible. And so, but that whole thing about dynamic risk management uh, uh, really is so important here. Mm -hmm. Yep. Agreed. Actually, yeah, yeah. go ahead. No, go ahead, I ask, um, maybe I'm just rephrasing what you already said, but it's um, assuming that everything you know on your network that's happening is bad, and only allowing the things through um, that are known good. You know, as a, a different way of, of approaching. Yeah. And, so, and I think that, and I want to hit the back on the risk assessment point of view. I think that. Just to give you a little bit of more info, right? Right. We, um, as for day to day, we are seeing a lot of more effort being put into how we actually look strategically at a, uh, around systems from risk than we used to. I think we we don't treat things equally. We we look at things from the asset value perspective, and we are building a threat models that you know are equal to the value of the content and how we you know how we're going to secure things down. So when you are designing. Um, a production environment in the cloud. How much uh, how much of that design is leveraging what's already there, right? Say in Azure, uh, or in a tool you're using to transfer media into and out of the cloud, versus you know, Omer, some of the things I think that you're alluding to that you know you you have to really think about and implement kind of on your own, right? Certainly, Avid has these things, these conversations all the time are about building security, obviously into the tool sets that are application layers sitting on top of cloud infrastructure. But, you know, how much of, how much of that is, is, uh, is, is, I guess, custom almost DIY style, right? Type of security methodologies to achieve what Spencer's talking about, right? Uh, zero trust versus what you're just taking advantage of that already exists, right? In some of these uh, infrastructures. Right. I mean, I, I think we're still in the phase, phase where we're actually just taking, um, I don't want to say the migration of, of technology from non-cloud to cloud, but we're still seeing that even the, even the workflows that are built in cloud, um, treating security as an add-on. Um, and, and I think that's actually costing more in, in terms of time and effort, because what happens in times in, in, cost, in cost and money, because you can actually do things and scale them up on the longer term if you use more cloud native technology at design time. Um, and, and you're correct, you're 100% you're right. We, there, there are a lot of gaps where we see where there could be provision, security provisions built in from, from the network side as policy, uh, which are now leveraged today. And they are available in the Azure cloud, for example. Policy is a big deal in Azure, and then you can go and implement and write policies that can you know, lock you down um, across different tenants or different customers or different product lines. And we don't see that. Joel, what, what do you think? I mean, in terms of uh, all the all the scenarios you're, I'm sure, running into all the time, you know, how much of that is, you know, just inherent in the tools that people have available versus anything they may have to create on their own? Well, I think in, in general, it's, it's advisable not to, uh, not to recommend that customers create their own stuff. Um, you know, one of, one of the things that we talk about in, in reference just to, to cloud in general is the amount of research and development that goes into uh, securing, you know, designing for security mm -hmm. and, and deploying and, and managing it in the same way. Um, you know, as a, as a, a large scale, hyperscale public cloud provider, we have thousands of engineers and, and site operators that, you know, their job is to um, protect the platform and, and provide the tools that are going to, uh, you know, let a partner or a customer or a service provider protect themselves. Um, you know, that's, that said, we're also trying to provide that prescriptive guidance, whether it's through, you know, as Omer referenced, uh, you know, the policy management and, and scripts and frameworks um, to best practices guidance. But, um, you know, I think, like we said at the, at the start, the capabilities are in, uh, in the platform. Um, there are things that application vendors 
um, should be taking into consideration in the way that they handle assets and integrate, uh, you know, and, and are integrated with um, the asset systems in the cloud. Um, you know, but at the same time, it's it's designing um, your solution, and that's you as the end customer. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, to make sure that you are mitigating the risks that that Spencer was talking about, and um, you know, making you know, taking those steps on the last mile of educating users and and configuring systems for. Um, you know, for those lights out scenarios, whether it's, um, you know, assume breach or uh, some other kind of catastrophe that you have to recover from. Yep. Yep. No, that's a good point. I mean, um, the other thought I had as you were talking there is, you know, uh, in order to have uh, the zero trust architecture, um, any anything there that becomes cost prohibitive, meaning, you know, as you, as you try to architect and build uh, is a true zero trust architecture, um, you know, does it ever get to the point where, you know, the cost is just too great almost, you know what I mean? Do, do, you, ever, do you have any thoughts on any of that? Or is there, is there, uh, is that just yeah. not the case? Yeah, well, and I think Omer, um, he alluded to it in talking about asset classification. And that really is, is kind of the core component of, of security and, and cost performance is how much is that asset worth to you um, and for how long? Yeah. Um, you know, if it's, if you're dealing with say, you know, reality TV or a cooking show, um, there's sensitivity around, uh, around your data, but, you know, is it the same as a huge uh, science fiction release? You know, pick your, pick your franchise. Um, so, you know, the amount that you have to spend, whether that's on management and operations or in core security tools, needs to be commensurate with the value and the time to live for that content. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. you know, that, that as, a, as a cost factor, um, you know, if you are not baking that into your risk analysis, can, can totally get out of control and can be overkill for, uh, for what you're, you're doing. You know, but on the other side of that, the cloud infrastructure and increasingly the tools that run on top of it cover a lot of that for you. Um, you still have to be aware and, and you have to, to plan and operate a secure environment, but you are getting the, you know, by running in the cloud, you're getting the benefit of all of that engineering and all of that configuration that if you were doing your own onsite um, or even a hybrid model, you have to take that responsibility. And, yeah, uh, I think that, that's, that's really important. I mean, the, the common security architecture it is designed to be highly scalable. Um, you know, if you read the thing, we we actually picked three levels, but the three levels that we picked there are, are really about demonstrating how it can be scaled. It's exactly yeah. as Joel says. It's based upon your risk tolerance and your budget, right? And if, if you think that the things are not not going to uh, uh, be, you know, the, the, the likelihood of an incident is, is low or you can live with a business consequence of an incident, then you, you, you've got more risk tolerance than if you're, you can't even afford a single frame to, be, to escape. Yeah. Well, and, yep. and I was just going to add that, um, you know, part of your risk tolerance is, is your um, resiliency. Um, yeah. Because, you know, at, at, with assumed breach, you have to figure that, if, you know, that you're already breached, but also you have a recovery plan whether that's um, restoring for backups or, or switching to different systems, um, you know, that's, that's as important um, part of your system as, as defending from the attack in the first place, as we've seen from all these ransomware attacks. And Yeah, and I, I think it's very important that, 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 that remember that the Zero Trust really reduces the, the uh, risk of a catastrophic breach. Um, mm-hmm. The Defense Innovation Board, in one of their papers on Zero Trust, said that, that Snowden couldn't have done what he did if the NSA had used yeah. Zero Trust. But uh, but I I, well, I just want to add a little bit of like some like it's kind of, it could be considered anecdotal, but the fact is, you know, we're not considered very creative because we're engineers. But at the end of the day, uh, in our day to day practically, uh, one of the things that we do see that the security principles are solid, but we also have to be a little creative about how we actually manage the risk and security. So we see um, when we are assessing a lot of applications and security uh, workflows, um, 
a lot of times we have to think out of the box in terms of coming up with mitigating controls. So it's not just you have to do one thing. There was a lot of um, a lot, there was a lot of leeway in terms of how you can con consider mitigating controls to go around specific uh, hurdles that you come across. And um, and in our, in my day to day, I see all the times where we 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 see some some technology that comes across our um, come comes across uh, and we see that it can't meet some demand requirements of some, but we are able to creatively you know get the zero trust ideas or get the idea of strong authentication implemented through mitigating control. So. The point being is security, um, though it's, it needs to be solid, you can design security in a way that it doesn't have to be done one singular way. There is multiple ways to slice the bread and you can, you can kind of get the same results. Um, and then cloud enables that. The cloud has enough, enough different um, you know, plumbing and different kind of uh, controls built in that you can achieve the same level of security with different set of controls. Yeah, well, certainly. Oh, I'm sorry, Ray. No, no, right. I was just going to say the, uh, the the costs certainly longer term could be much worse if you don't build it in right, right on the front end. So I don't know what Spencer was alluding to there, but sorry, Joel, Joel go ahead. Yeah, maybe we should spend a, a minute or two talking about uh, that concept of compensating controls. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there are, are new frameworks uh, coming out there specifically targeted at the uh, M&E industry, um, you know, from CDSA and from, uh, from Motion Picture Association. But um, you know, as a as part of your resiliency, um, you know, having having fallbacks um, as part of your uh, zero trust architecture, or as just part of your you know general operational framework, um, is a good way of of reducing and, and tolerating risk. You know, in in, in large scale systems, we call it a, a risk register. You know, all of those things that are potentially going to go wrong. Um, with your platform or your infrastructure or, or you know, your, your day-to-day -day operations and management. Um, the more of that that you understand and the more that you design around um, those eventualities, then you know, the better off you are um, either when something happens or, or you know, when it comes time to rebuild in the aftermath. That's a good point. How about um, another thought is you know, performance, right? Uh, are there any performance, uh, negative, I should say, performance impacts? Um, and I'm talking from an application perspective when, when implementing sort of a zero trust architecture. Well, Omar, I'd be interested in, in your you know, real world experiences, but as a, you know, I think just as a, a, a matter of course, um, security doesn't introduce performance hits um, you know, certain, you know, security protocols, like for a VPN could introduce a slight bit of latency, but you're talking like microseconds. Um, mm -hmm. It's not something that a user is, uh, is going to notice. I think we've, we've reached a point in, in how these systems function that so much is done in parallel. Um, and there's, you know, really so much compute power being thrown at it that a performance hit is not your chief concern um you know because when when you're dealing with that you know, it's like if the concern is um is that going to impact my editorial um you know pipeline or, or workflow because now i'm having to decrypt in real time and um you know, now i've got to think about trusted execution if i'm on a, a remote workstation um you know that it's that's informed by your risk tolerance because if everything has to be encrypted 100% of the time, that's going to, you know, pose a challenge to the tool. Right. How does it, how does it function in a, uh, in a fully encrypted environment? Um, you know, in most cases, when you're actually operating on those assets, um, you're in a secure enough zone that that's not um, an issue or, or that's not required. Um, it, you know, it tends to be the storage in transit, storage and uh, or, or assets in transit or uh, or at rest. Um, you know where where that you know that kind of concern is, is more present, mm -hmm. uh, but still not a you know not what I would consider a meaningful performance set. I think the particularly about encryption. If you you look at the the, the encryption engines that are part of the, the Intel core are, are 
processors, right? They're built into them, they're not separate modules. They are incredibly fast. I mean, yeah. you just talk about wire speed here. It's, it's uh, uh, even if you encrypted everything going into the CPU, I, I'm not sure you would really notice any any slowdown at all unless you were me measuring in very small uh, percentages. Yeah, in, in the early days of VPN, you could see, you know, 5, 10, 20% right. um, you know, latency degradation and performance by putting an, uh, an IP firewall in. Um, nowadays, yeah, I mean, there's, there's just nothing. Yeah, but I think those, those days are not, I mean, uh, we see a lot of um, implementations and we see a lot of uh, examples of where we, they are implementing zero trust, where they actually have like inspection, um, inspection networks that take all the data or they, they mirror the entire traffic and they, and they put it through some kind of an IDPS or IDS. And it, the, the fact is, at the end of the day, encryption is, um, is advertised as zero performance hit for, by most cloud vendors. Um, network for network performance in terms of tra traversing multiple different um, uh, multiple different cloud providers could possibly have a cost a performance cost, but it's almost negligible uh, negligible in terms of you know the, to the consumer um, and to the end user. But if you're staying in the same fabric, if you're staying in the same cloud fabric in say like an Azure, um, there are multiple different me methods of how to get around performance issues. So performance, I think, from from our perspective. Um, isn't really inhibit, isn't really affected by security. In <clears> fact, <throat> I think that there are the security tool manufacturers are keeping up and are cognizant of you know making sure that the tools sit in in line or passively and do not actually you know have any uh, adverse effect on overall end user you know performance from that. Yeah, a, cust a, IP customer, mm -hmm. a customer should never um, have performance as a consideration or or as a blocker. Um, for deploying security, and and you know even even when looking at um, you know a multi-cloud architecture, um, the performance hit um, you know what little bit that there is uh, is not going to come from uh, your security processes. If anything, it's going to be as you're ingesting and egressing data between clouds, so it's more a network issue. Um, you know, and the the type of pipe that you, that you have either from on-prem or you know going from Internet to internet, um, you know that that's where you need to design for performance. It's not you know whether or not you flip on security. So, Amir, uh, when you uh, are evaluating uh, software applications or service offerings, what are what are some of the key things that you are looking for in those applications from a security perspective? I mean, I think what Spencer's paper covered is pretty good list, right? I mean, one of the few things, one of the starting points is like, how do you actually do authentication? And do you actually, you know, are aware of how to do authentication with say like a, a single, uh, with an SSO and, and, and kind of separate that out from your, authentic, uh, from your authorization model. A lot of applications um, still have baked in authorization and authentication together which causes a lot of problems in later, down, when, later down the road when they are trying to scale up or trying to go through uh, reviews. Um, the other issues that I think what we also see um, is how data is secured at rest. Um, we, we, do, we do see a lot of issues with um, data not being, um, for, for example, we see a lot of issues where a, a, a vendor should have actually thought about how to, how to manage data from multiple different vendors or multiple different clients. And multi-tenancy um, design considerations are still like, can, can be better. Um, people can uh, think about how to store data in different um, storage mechanisms where they're kept separately and compute can be common. Um, so that's one of the two kind of two top things that I see all the time that could be improved. Um, how to actually keep authorization and uh, authentication separate and uh, design some multi-tenancy from 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 basically from design, and that would help. The, the, there are two things uh, there in what what Omar said. One is the concept of multi-tenancy, um, and then the service provider paradigm to use a. a you know, mark and texture word. Um, so on the on multi-tenancy, that you know that presents a particular problem, at least that I've seen with major studios, because um, you know they need to be the one and only operator in an environment, um, and at the same time they you know they are loath to permit access to any outside party. Um, so you know then rotate that ninety degrees and look at um, 
layered service providers. So where somebody is operating in the cloud, um, you know, so it's it's uh, somebody with a uh, a rendering environment or uh, you know or a storage platform or something that's running on Azure, um, but it is isolated from the functionality of the cloud, um, you know, to a certain extent. Uh, that's where customers need to be looking to the vendors and to those providers to make sure that you know those assessments have been done, that that those design reviews have been done, to make sure that the way that abstraction is done um, is still you know maximally protecting assets. And so, if it's something where you've got multiple organizations running within a single service on top of Azure, so it's a single tenant. Um, that that introduces other risks that um, if you were running in your own tenant or running that same solution in your tenant, um, you know, that you can you can control for that. Um, there, you know, I, I think on that, there, there's not really an easy answer. You have to weigh um, the risks and opportunities to make sure that your tenancy um, is meeting your, you know, your particular needs. Is there any, um... Limitation. One of the questions in the Q and A is: Are there limitations uh, from uh, a smaller company perspective in implementing zero trust architectures? Meaning, is there anything prohibitive there uh, that would prevent a small company from taking advantage of this approach? No. I, in fact, I would. With Joe and I'm probably laugh at me, but I, I think it's actually probably cheaper to do that because we say you, you, you're assuming your network is in breach. That's your starting point. So. All, all that money you're putting into stopping your network being in breach is, is secondary to, to what you're trying to solve. Yep. And, yep. I, and I think, and I would, I would, I would, I would just say that um, we've seen a lot of companies grow from a small startups to, to medium sized companies and even grow larger than that. I think that if you go with zero trust architecture, um, you can actually, I mean, the way it's implemented or the way you can implement it in distributed fashion. Um, you can scale cost up. So if you're a small company and you and cost is quite important to you, as well as you can, you know, uh, since everything is separated out, you can build as you go, um, rather than having a whole centralized stack of technology and network stack that you want to buy up front. That rather than doing all of that, you can kind of build distributed security stacks around each component, and that will help also in terms of lowering the cost up front. <laughs> Yeah, th this can all seem very oppressive, you know, particularly for a, a smaller organization. Um, you know, but part of your consideration has to be how much is that asset worth to you? Um, and that's not just, you know, your own intellectual property, but, you know, the IP of whoever, you know, you might be working for, um, as well as reputational damage. And that, you know, that's not something that's unique to media and entertainment. That's, you know, in general to any business. Um, you know, what kind of a hit are you going to take if you get breached? Um, and, you know, it's not just the exposure of data, but, you know, the loss of, uh, of business uh, that results from that breach. Um, you know, so the, the cost that a smaller organization is, uh, you know, is going to bear has to be commensurate with that. And if, you know, if you're working with a, a tier one theatrical release and you don't have the security systems in place to, uh, you know, to meet the uh, the needs of the studio, they're either not going to give you the work or you're going to pay on the back end if anything happens. So uh, this has been great. We only have a few minutes left uh, before the bottom of the hour or the top of the hour, I should say. Um, so with that, um, I guess I'll just go around the, the, the table here. Omer, any, any practical uh, things you can offer that people should be thinking of when, when you know, designing a, a production environment to run on the cloud from a security perspective? Um, I, my basic thing would say was cloud is your friend. Leverage cloud native technologies as much as you can. Um, don't build your own plumbing. Don't build your own network plumbing around cloud because it's probably already done. Um, like akin to like the old thing of don't roll your crypto, right? Don't roll your own system from scratch. A lot of work, like Joel said, has been done. Leverage on people uh, who have spent thousands of hours to build this and build your system on top using the tools that are already there. So that will be my one of my you know, parting thoughts about security and how to build a secure uh, in cloud. Joel, any, anything from you? Um, yeah, just mirroring that and, and understanding what your risks are. Um, that's what's going to dictate 
a lot of what you do um and you know be be aware of the things that are available to you um in you know general industry guidance you know things like um you know what's coming out of movie lab and other uh, trusted security organizations and educate yourself and your partners um you know and your your people uh, on ways to um, you know to mitigate the threats and and just you know protect yourself yeah Spencer, other than download the security white paper, uh, any, uh, any download uh, the architecture network. Uh, yeah, but I, I think I just really echo exactly what uh, I said was was the architecture is built around the principle that we don't need to design all that shit into the architecture. Excuse my language, sir, um, because the cloud providers do do it so well. That's why we've got those boxes in there. That says supporting security components, and yeah. they do that bit. Um, yeah, totally. Uh, you don't trust the, the the cloud providers to do the security, then yeah, not sure yeah. you know much about security. <laughs> well, this has been fantastic, guys. I, I want to thank each and every one of you for taking the time out to do this today. I want to thank everybody who uh, participated both here on Zoom and on all the different social channels. Uh, this recording will be sent out to anyone who signed up. And we'll also make it available publicly when, uh, and we'll let you guys know when that's available. We'll also answer any questions that came in that we didn't get to in the live session. Uh, but once again, guys, thank you so much uh, for your time today. This was really, really uh, informational, and I, I appreciate everyone's time. So yeah, thank you all. And, and, and hosting is awesome. Yeah. Thank thanks, you. guys. Have a good thank rest you. of your day, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.